Hi, everyone. My name is Jackson Pino. I am the public affairs manager here at NAR, and I'm going to be walking you through the final residential market update uh, for December of 2023. Let's walk through a uh, quick agenda here for you. We're gonna kick things off with a monthly housing chart that we all know and love. Uh, we're gonna dive into a quick peek at a new project that David and I have been working on in seller contributions. Uh, we will then transition into some market segment charts for you. Then we'll zoom out and take a wider look at the uh, larger housing market. And then in the final minutes of the hour we have today, we'll answer some of the questions that you might have. Before we do, let's take our quote of the session. You know that I love to give you guys a quote to kick things off and set some context here. And I know that we all have been dealing with yet another time of change and adjustment, not only here in our realtor industry, maybe the Twin Cities housing market, might be things going on, you know, at home. It is the holidays after all. And things are, it's a point of change, especially now at the end of the year, right? Um, and I was looking at inspirational quotes, and this one's pretty bold and dramatic, but it, it really stuck with me. Uh, this is uh, from Louise Erdrich. Uh, she's considered one of the most important writers of the second wave of Native American Renaissance. Uh, Louise Erdich is the author of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and children's books, many of which hold numerous awards and nominations. In fact, in 2021, her book, The Night Watchman, won the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. She is an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of the Chippewa Indians. She has this quote uh, that I want us to kind of just keep in the back of our minds. Things which do not grow and change are dead things. Pretty dramatic, right? Um, and that's something that I want us to all see, not, you know, it's got some negative uh, connotation in there, right? But I want us to be inspired, compelled, if you will, to adapt, to grow, to change. Uh, and the best way that I can think to help you do that is to provide this market update. So that way you have the information to take advantage of those new opportunities, to dodge those threats, and to adapt and change, right? So let's look at the November housing market. Um, starting things off with the demand side of uh, the market in terms of closed sales. Now, you guys are all familiar with this. By now, we're looking just at the most recently completed month, November closed sales here in the Twin Cities. And we're looking at 2023 on into the past. And as you can see here, 2023 closed the month, or the month of November in 2023, closed off with 3,200-ish closed sales. That's 7% down from 3,500 last year, sure, but that's not what we're all looking at, right? We're looking at that 37.5% decrease from November of last year, which we're relatively at now, compared to 5,600 in November of 2021. Or as realtors, we're seeing this day in and day out, especially if you've been here for four or more years, like you're feeling that, it feels down. And I want us to start things off just a little bit of time here on this first chart to really set some context here, um, because I think the context is really important. Look at the uh, previous slide, uh, the previous uh, bar charts from 2016 to 2019, it looks fairly stable at 4,400 to 4,700, give or take. And this is just November's from 2016 to 2019. And here I'll put this little dotted line chart, uh, dotted line across so that way you can kind of visually see what I'm talking about here. You can see we saw an abnormally high performance for a fourth quarter month in terms of demand uh, in November of 2020 and 2021, right? It's far above that red line. And in response, we're seeing two following years that are far below that red line. And David and I both have this, this growing theory right now that because of the run-on inflation, uh, the high demand that was happening in 2020 and 2021, 
uh, that the people who might have been considering to buy a home in 2022 and 2023 chose that opportunity, some may see as, you know, the decade uh, to uh, buy when interest rates were at an all-time low for that decade uh, and buy as soon as possible, especially, I mean, fourth quarter, right? 5,700 uh, sales in November of 2020. And because of that, you're seeing uh, fewer people who had, you know, the taste to buy in 2022 and 2023. In short, it's a correction. And I want, I want to encourage you to keep that theme as we're looking through this uh, and notice it as a correction and how we are correcting ourselves out of something that was abnormal. And ideally, in the long run, we're going to return back up to that red dot again, right? So... Looking at pending sales, that that is pretty similar to what we're seeing, right? It's not as consistent as 2016 through 2019 in terms of pending sales. You can see there's that moderate growth from 3,500 up to 4,000, and then boom, 4,700, almost 4,800 in the onset of the pandemic for again November pending sales for 2020 to 2021, right? And then that correction that we're currently in right now. Ending the month of November in 2023 at 2,800 uh, homes that went off the market and under contract, right? That's a percent and a half down from last year. And last year was about 40% down from the year before that, right? That's what you're all feeling right now, I'm sure. But again, let's keep in that idea of a correction that we will eventually ease our way out of. New listings, the supply side of that conversation you can see a, a similar dynamic happening here but in a scale that's much more small right um a pretty standard uh pre-pandemic levels and not as huge of an uptick in new listings slightly up right um but a correction of down 16 percent for november of 2022 and then a little silver lightning here. We're up a little bit. In uh, 5.3% up from that dip um, to 3,600 and change homes that were listed in November of this year. Right? Still a correction, but it's not as strong. Why might that be the case, right? Um, not one. It's a, a different side of the dynamic. These people on the pending side of the equation uh, or the demand side, they're uh, they're looking to buy, uh, they don't have the asset, they have the money, right? But what's specific here on new listings, right? They have to be a buyer uh, when they sell their home. For the most part, people are not selling their home and going into nothingness, right? Or going into a home that they already own. They're usually going to be buying another home. And as we can see, there isn't a strong taste to be buying a home right now, right? Compared to the previous two years in 2020 and 2021, right? Um, and essentially, and I think we can all mention this without uh, going all the way down to it, uh, interest rates are a dynamic factor that has changed someone's taste to go and buy a new home. That interest rate uh, has doubled, more than doubled from the heights that we were seeing in 2020, 2021 low 3% interest rates, right? But let's not dive into that right now because we'll definitely talk about it. Let's talk into something that I think we are all eager to make sure uh, stays, you know, a stable, predictable growth pattern, median sale price. This is a chart of November median sales price. And as you can see, we ended the month at median sales price of $362,000 from Twin Cities. That's up 2% from a year prior. And that, that's a promising thing. We're uh, getting close to ending the year in only a couple of days. And uh, about a year ago, we were really concerned that we would see regular uh, decreases in median sales price. And in fact, we only experienced a decrease in month uh, monthly versions of year over year uh, decrease in sales price in a single month. We can see that here in our year over year change of median sales price and the far right column right here, look at that, there's only a single month that we were down. Now, it could have been way worse than that. And then in fact, in some 
parts of the country. We'll see later in this presentation it was. Uh, it looks like we hit a floor of just about that net zero change and we bounced off of it and we are going back to a, a smaller but still uh, sustainable uh, growth pattern of about, you know, two and a half percent. Uh, ideally, we want to get back to what we were seeing in, you know, 2018, 2019. We see that five to 7% uh, year over year change in median sales price. That's that stable, predictable linear growth that we saw in years past. And we'd like to get back to. And ideally, we will, right? Uh, another way of uh, viewing that comparison of, you know, sales price. Uh, is looking at the percent of original list price, the negotiation metric, if you will, right? Um, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing a relatively stable uh, uh, percent of original list price at about 97 and change percent, or about 97.5 percent of uh, the original list price was received of homes that were listed and then closed on, right? Um, and then in the pandemic, even in November, because remember, we're looking at only November numbers for each of these bar charts here, that uh, November of 2020, it was at and slightly above original list price. Again, for a fourth quarter metric, that's abnormal, right? And then that correction, luckily in this instance, that correction is about, is about back to where we see that level of stability in 2017, 2018, 2019 was at 97% change. And look at November of 2023, we're at 97.4% of original risk price received. That's, that's good. That's promising, right? That's what we should expect to see in a non-pandemic year, right? Another great metric, and this is a metric that I have uh, grown to embrace as the way to measure the speed of the market. You guys have probably heard me say this before. Um, how quickly are homes leaving the marketplace, right? Uh, cumulative days on market. This is good. looking at median cumulative days on market, in fact. So the numbers that you are seeing here, how of all homes sold in that given November of that calendar year, and half of homes sold uh you know it took longer than that number to sell right and as you can see last month November. November of 2023 half of all homes sold in under 23 days that's eight percent uh, uh faster than half of all homes being sold in 25 days in 2022 right but that's not the the market that we were seeing in 2020 and 2021 where it was down to almost two weeks you know, 15, 16 days on market, and then home was snatched up, right? That is definitely different than almost a month, you know, 29 days, 31, 33 days prior to the pandemic. We're starting to correct back out of a hyper-fast frenzy of a market, even in November, to something that is closer to what we were seeing in those pre-pandemic levels, right? November inventory. This is one of those things that we've been keenly watching because as you can clearly see here, uh, you know, going further back than what I've been referencing so far in this presentation, you'll notice an elephant in the room on the far left of this screen, right? Inventory and uh, inventory bubble in the 2008-2009 financial crisis, right, uh, is apparent here in the left side of this chart. And it has been down ever since. Now, Let's not get on the soapbox and why that was happening, right? Um, but that is the equilibrium that we're in now of a much uh, tighter inventory than what we're used to. And that is shown here to still be the case, right? Yes, we are up from 2020 and 2021, but we are we're still lower than an equilibrium point uh, that we can see through our next chart of uh, 2012 to 2014, ideally is where we'd want to be to be a uh, balanced inventory. Um, we ended up having November 30th with 7,800 homes left on the market. That's 5% down from 
uh, where we were at in 2022, and still not quite back to the inventory levels that we saw pre-pandemic. Certainly not where we were at. And what I'm calling a balanced economy by way of measuring our month's supply of inventory here in this chart. Academically, we want four to six months supply of inventory. And you can see we only really had that in about 2011, 2014, in terms of November month supply of inventory, right? Um, and we are currently sitting at two month supply of inventory. Yes, that is absolutely up from where we were last year. 13.8% up, in fact, and it's even more uh, of an increase than what we were at in November of 2020 and 2021, right? Um, we're about back where we were pre-pandemic levels of inventory, but please keep in mind that we are still in a strong seller's market because we have about half the inventory relative to the demand that we have uh, that... Uh, would fit uh, that demand, right? We're not at four months supply, we're at about half of that, two months supply. And again, just not gonna go all the way back to demand. You guys remember how sharp of a drop off that has been in recent years, right? The inventory doesn't experience that huge drop off that we were seeing in the first couple of charts. The demand side does. So yes, our month supply of inventory has grown, but it's due to the lack of demand. It's the lack of closed sales, the people who are willing to go and close on that home, right? It's not due to all of a sudden we have dramatically more inventory. In fact, the inventory has gone up, yes, a couple of thousand, but not. it's a whole order of magnitude uh, that we would need to go up in order to be at a balanced market. Right. Something to keep in mind. I do want to keep moving on here because we're, we're about a third of the way through to jump into this keynote topic and seller contributions. Um, before I do, I do see a uh, uh, chat. Uh, stay close to Mike. Uh, right. Sorry, David. Um, we're, we're doing the best we can with what we got. Um, the audio, we're, we're working on it. I apologize for the people live and the people at YouTube. Uh, my audio is not the best, but we will continue to move on. Um, uh, seller contributions. Let's talk uh, this keynote topic. And honestly, this came um, originally uh, as one of the first projects that David and I were working on together a couple of years ago at the onset of the pandemic. Um, and I will say we, we kind of let it go because at that time, there really weren't a lot of seller contributions because naturally there's not a demand, right? Um, but luckily for you all and luckily for us and our own curiosity, um, we had uh, our own MAR president, Jerry Moskowitz, uh, call me up the other day and just ask out of curiosity, hey, what's going on with seller contributions? Has that changed any? You know what? We had something for you. Uh, and we revived it, and boy, I'm glad we did, because it is super interesting. Um, I will say these charts are uh, a little uh, rough. They're not as uh, you know clean as some of the ones we normally do, so bear with us. But uh, I hope you can appreciate the knowledge we're trying to bring to you hot and fast here, okay? So let's hop into them. Let's start off first with just talking about how many people actually come to the table as a seller uh, and have dollars to contribute for closing, right? Um, this is a chart that's going to take a 12 month average of the share of all those sales, every sale throughout a given month, a 12 month average. And what's the percentage of people who are the sellers coming to closing with contribution, right? Right. Uh, David, I think you might be on your mic because I got a big double echo. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, let's start things off when we started measuring. January of 2022, uh, we had 29% ish of all uh, closed sales uh, had a seller contributing something. We'll get into the dollar amounts in a minute, but at least something, right? And as that run on inflation and that increased demand continued 
it was a 12 month average, mind you, 12 month average. Of, uh, 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 about starting in May, uh, we had the lowest point that we measured of only about a quarter of sellers would come to the table uh, with some, some sort of you know dollar figure to contribute, right? Um, and then what happened? We started seeing a change in interest rates to combat inflation. And because of that, there was there were fewer people willing to come to the table. Demand started to ease, right? There was that softening of buyer activity. Um, and because of that, in response, sellers started to contribute more at the closing table, right? Increased up to, let's say, the beginning of this year, about 31%. Um, of closed sales were seller, uh, included some sort of seller contribution, and as of the most recently completed month in November, thirty-seven percent of uh, all closed sales included some seller contribution. Really interesting here, right? Um, I find this sort of thing fascinating, fascinating as a way of showing uh, that negotiation more than just you know percent uh, over original list price, but uh, another measure of this, right? Uh, and now keep in mind, this is a 12 month average. This is smoothed out to give you the average of all the previous 12 months for each of these points, right? Now, if you just look at the monthly uh, metric of this in this slide here, here's the, sh the share of sales with seller contributions at monthly level. But you can notice that it's highly seasonal, right? You get these waves of peaks and troughs that are happening throughout the season. And the lines that you're seeing here is at the beginning of a given year. You can see the winter months, you have, seller who, you have sellers who are more likely to contribute at closing. And in the summer months, less likely. That's obvious, right? But what I want you to pay attention to um, and yes, uh, Christine, it is as little as a dog, um, any contribution, anything that's not zero. Um, now, uh, what I do want you to pay attention to is uh, look at the first two years and keep in mind that these are the two years where you have, you know, lower interest rates that run on inflation, uh, hyperactivity from buyers, right? Um those troughs are as low as 16% of sellers coming to the table with contributions, right? And then after that second 16, you know, uh, June-ish of uh, 2022, we start to see interest rates tick up and mortgage rates uh, tick up because of that. Buyer, um, Buyer activity is softening. Now we have a new low point in the trough for 2023 at 26%, right? That's rudimentary, right? It's just, we're looking at one level of this right now, and it's just the only statistics, but it is compelling information. Uh, mm -hmm. I found it really interesting. I hope you do too. Um, if you do, and I do have one more chart, we're going to look at the prices here in a minute, uh, but if you do find this sort of stuff interesting and you want us to, you know, kind of tease some more information out on here, please type in the chat right now, hey, I'm interested, something like that. It'll give us a clue that, hey, this is worth uh, jumping into and spending more of our time. We want to refine the type of information that uh, you are all interested in, right? So let's take a look at the seller contributions. Now, this is average seller contributions. That excludes zero. We didn't want to include the people who didn't come to the table with seller contributions, right? It's a dollar and up, right? And you can see it's very sporadic. It's, kind of, it's not the prettiest looking thing, right? So I took a look at that dotted line. That's that's a, it's a curve, essentially, that's based off of this. It's a trend line, right? Um, and you can see there is an upwards trajectory. That's just a visual cue for here for you to see that there has been an upwards trajectory, even preceding the um, uh, that March or that May 2022 moment. But particularly looking at the blue dots now, you can see there's a there's a whole uh, shift up to around an average of seven grand from about. July of 2022 on 
movement and then a spike again in September to almost an average of $9,000 as an average. Now keep in mind the worries of averages, right? If you have one that just rockets you all the way up, that's why we get a not a very pretty uh, line chart right here, right? Um, but it does show a general trend of us increasing not only the share of seller contributions, but the amount they're contributing when they do contribute. Super interesting stuff. Um, I hope you do find that helpful. We're about halfway through our presentation, so I want to make sure that we're moving on. Uh, thank you for anybody who did say that you're interested in the chat. I want to move on to some market segmentation. So uh, those of you who are you know, interested in a particular segment of the market you might be keenly aware that we like to give you these charts. Let's uh let's jump back right into them so that way you can get your, your market segmentation fix. You know? Um starting things off, townhouse condo market share, right? These are uh homes sold that are townhomes or condos as opposed to single family, right? And you can see that we are uh at, we are at twenty-seven ish percent um for the twin cities MSA. Um that's means that what we have 73 percent of homes in November of 2023 were single family homes, right? So the line share is still single family, but town home and townhouse and condo market share has increased from years past, particularly all the way back to 2006. This is a, a relative high. You know, particularly a, a decades long time, at least, right? right? Um, something to know uh, as we, you know, shift back into that correction phase that we've been talking about uh, and into something that we would have like to see in the long term as a new normal, right? Townhouse condo seems to be increasing this year. Let's see if it sticks, right? Uh, new, new construction. Uh, new construction has been fascinating for the past couple of years because, you know, like most, they did see a dip. You know, you can see the share of new construction of homes sold in the Twin Cities uh, went down from 2020 to 2021, right? Um, but after the fact, it's it's lagging as opposed to what we were seeing in you know the overall market in terms of closed sales. Um, they're up. Uh, from 10.5% in 2022 to 12% in 2023. Now, if you're at all curious as to what we think has something to do with it, um, we did write a blog about this and new construction and uh, what particular parts of the market in new construction are particularly seeing this benefit. Um, it's on our website. By all means, go and take a look at the blog. We'll uh, We'll share it if you guys are really curious about it. But um, it is up, and that is something to be aware of where it's up and in what particular property types as well. So, speaking of some particular property types, more bets, please. Um, this is a chart that looks at the percentage of sales that had four plus bedrooms. We started looking at this again at the onset of 2020 because we noticed a sharp increase in this case. Uh, November of 2019, 40% of homes were four bedrooms plus, and then 42 almost percent of uh, bedrooms uh, in 2020 were uh, four bedrooms plus, right? Um, it looks like that has eased off in recent years. We're now down to just below 40%. That's about where we were pre-pandemic. Not quite at where we were in 2015 through 2018, but it is. Uh, it looks like the sudden urge to have a larger home isn't quite what it once was in a few years ago, right? Probably because we don't have large mandates to be quarantining. Uh, there's a strong urge for people to come back to the workplace and come back to work in offices, right? Um, and there are, there's less need for that extra bedroom to have an office or two, right? Um, so again, let's keep that in mind as we move into uh, 2024. Uh, and something that I think uh, I know David in particular has really been interested in this is uh, cash deals uh, as a percentage of market share. Uh, we have a few charts on this because it is particularly interesting. 
um, in all these other charts, market segmentation that we've been talking about is how do you slice and dice the home, right? Here, we're talking about how you slice and dice paying for the home, right? Uh, and in cash deals uh, since 2020, they have been going up and they've been going up quickly um, from 10% of all closed sales in November of 2020 being cash sales to 12 and a half percent in 2021, the next year, 15%. And now this year uh, in 2023, 17.3% of uh, sales were done with cash. Uh, now we have, we have two areas that we see this happening more than others in terms of where along the price distribution, right? One might seem fairly obvious, right? The the lower end, that uh, you know, uh, two hundred thousand dollars and and lower, right? Because for some people, I wish I could say I was some of those people. Uh, they have the cash on hand to be able to pay for that, right? Um, other market where we are seeing this, and this is something that is definitely chart worthy, is the million plus uh, cash deals as a percentage of uh, a million plus sales, right? Uh, that is impressive to see that we are at 34.5% in 2023. Uh, and then, uh, you know, at, from a baseline of what we were seeing during the pandemic of 24.8 to 24.5%, uh, we're suddenly seeing an increase in cash deals at the luxury price. Um, this is something we're watching very closely, particularly in this price segment, uh, to try to understand why we have some, some running theories, you know? Um, I mean, market conditions, and not just housing market conditions, but I mean, overall market conditions uh, would be our first guess. You know, we're, we're seeing people uh, with excess money uh, that they don't want to put into a stock market uh, because the stock market is, uh, you know, highly volatile, right? They want something that might be a little bit more uh, stable. And they know, because we've had only one month where we had down uh, prices, that the housing market is still relatively stable. Let's invest while we can in cash because cash is going to be better than putting it into uh, buying a luxury home at a 7% mortgage rate, right? So, looking at one more way to slice and dice cash deals as a percentage of all sales, but now looking at it in terms of uh, property types. You can see that gray line there at the top, that 41.2% of condos uh, were uh, closed with cash. Again, that's that more affordable range of $200,000 or lower, right? Um, and then that 13% down at the bottom, your single family home uh, cash deals percent line. Uh, that's probably closer to where you would find more of your luxury homes, right? Um, the spread there is, it, it makes sense, right? The, the smaller the home, uh, potentially the cheaper it is, the more likely you're going to be able to make a cash deal. But what is interesting here is that it's happening in all property types, some more sensitive to it than others, right? The steeper that curve, the more uh, that percentage increases uh, has happened in recent years. All right, so let's zoom out with the, let's see, 10, 15 minutes or so we have left uh, and look at the wider economy, right? As you all know, we try to time this webinar with uh, NAR's November housing report. They, they release it the morning that we do this webinar. Uh, and I always like to try to make sure that you have at least the main numbers to take away uh, on region by region so you can kind of understand our own regional report card, so to speak. And as you can see, in terms of uh, closed sales for existing homes across the United States, we're down 7.3%. Uh, by region, uh, we're not we're not doing the worst, uh, but we're not doing the best, right? Uh, everybody's down. Um, the South is down only 4.3%. 
The Midwest and the West are fairly similar, around 8.7, 8.6% decrease uh, in closed sales for existing homes. And then the Northeast uh, is the one feeling the pain the most this November uh, with a year-over-year -year decrease of 13% in existing homes. Um, moving over to housing prices, we can see, again, promising increase in housing prices, not quite up to what we were seeing uh, in previous years for November, but it's still up. We can't complain, right? Across the United States, it's uh, uh, existing home sales prices are up 4%. Um, that is similar to what we're seeing northwest in the, sorry, the northeast and the midwest at about 4.8, 4.9%. The south lagging behind a little bit in increased home prices at about 3.5%. And the west leading the increase in housing prices at uh, just over 5% at the median. The big takeaway quote from Chief Economist Warren Tune at NAR says, uh, the latest weakness in existing home sales still reflects buyer the, the buyer bidding process, that uh, process of, you know, uh, will you go to the table when the mortgage rates are this high? Because as he says, the mortgage rates were at a two-decade high. It's harder for people to want to close on that home. Now, a marked turn can be expected as mortgage rates have plunged in recent recent weeks. His words, not mine. But if you want a visual for it, they are. Here is the 30-year average of a mortgage across the entire United States from the past 12 months. So that's year, right? And he is highlighting what you can see here in the uh, far right corner, that plunge from what, late October of this year to what just happened this week. And we are now uh, right around 6.8%, 6.9%. Um, we're under seven. Uh, we were almost at 8% as a 30-year average, uh, or sorry, a 30-year mortgage average, right? Um, that's great to see that we are down, uh, and that's what we're feeling, right? Let's keep in mind, we're still at a decade's time, right? That 7%, 6.9% uh, average for a 30-year mortgage is still what our buying clients are feeling, right? How are they feeling this, right? They're seeing this from a low of, let's, let's start at 2020 here, that 1600 monthly payment. Now this is a monthly principal interest taxes and insurance for the median price home based off of the income of the median family, right? Taking in a few assumptions here, 30 year uh, rates, assuming 10% down and uh, the percentages you see for tax rate and insurance, right? Uh, they're getting quite a deal at $1,600 a month. And uh, as I uh, have been told, this is a monthly payments business, and we need to be aware of that, right? They enjoy the monthly payment of $1,600. And look at the steep increase of what we were seeing uh, after the fact. Once interest rates were going up, there's been an increase of $1,000 in that monthly payment for the same median-priced home for the same family income, right? That's what they're feeling. Um, and when interest rates go down, we'll start to see this uh, line chart go down. Now, there is hope. I promise you there is. Because even though we were at that $1,000 increase from uh, a few, even just a few months ago, right? We are still at a percent of family income that is considered affordable. This is the same chart. We've now just, instead of looking at it in dollar amounts, we're looking at it as a share of the family's income. Right? And as you can see, we were getting, we were getting a great deal at 18.5% of that median family income, right? 
we have gone up absolutely and families are feeling that uh federal uh definition of affordable housing is that housing that can be paid for at 30 percent of your your income and we're at 25 percent we're still within that um that boundary right um it's not great it could be better and hopefully it will be but again that's just the start of the silver lining in all of this let's uh let's zoom out geographically now and take a look at FICO scores uh, on average by state. And there is one state right now uh, from our 2022, our latest available data set uh, that is in the green, that's 740 and above, right? And that's us. Now, again, there's distributions of financial scoring across many demographics, many ages, many groups uh, in Minnesota. But on the whole, that's a good sign for us, right? You know, it's also a good sign. Access to capital, right? How much money now? I and I wanted to highlight here, particularly millennials, because uh, I'll admit it, I'm a millennial, uh, and there are a lot of millennials that have this belief that they're never going to own a home, right? And that's just not necessarily true, right? That it, in terms of uh, funding uh millennials are in minnesota have a median of seventy seven thousand uh, dollars income that they are uh, that they could have right uh, that is a potential upside that's an opportunity uh particularly as they're getting into first time buying age many of them are already in that at around 37 years of age right now is the median first time home buyer. That is the prime first time home buyer market. Another perspective to see that that is sunny uh, is that our friends at Zonda, the new construction database that we, uh, we like to cite from, uh, shows Minneapolis as one of frankly many metropolitan areas uh, that are significantly overperforming in terms of new construction and development. That's good. More homes means we get more inventory to play with, right? And that will also help contribute to uh, increased affordability, right? People can move up into those new homes. Uh, and also, that will be something that are, when we do have more increased demand, there'll be a better balance of supply and demand due to our significantly overperforming development space right now. So uh, a final kind of note for you here, uh, case Shelly Home Price Index. I know you all have seen it before, and frankly, we put way too many of those lines on here. I've heard it a few times from people, so I've narrowed it down to just a few case studies. We're here in pink, right? You can see we didn't uh, see the uh, case Shelly Home price index of uh, our metro area balloon up to the heights of some areas like Atlanta, San Francisco, Seattle, and others, right? But we also did not drop off. You can see San Francisco in particular has had a rough year where their home prices uh, truly were seeing price drops. And we touched that bottom line and we bounced off, off like the average of the the entire US, right? Now we didn't benefit like some areas like Atlanta highlighted in very appropriately peach here. Um, I'm just realizing how funny the uh, coders at uh, Case Schiller are with their peach of Atlanta. Um, yeah, they, they did great. They had the highs uh, and didn't suffer as, as any of the price drop offs, right? They had diminishing growth, but they never got below that solid horizontal line. Um, neither did we for the most part. And that's something that we do need to appreciate. Um, we are almost out of the tunnel, out of the woods, whatever the metaphor you want it to be. There is light at the end of this tunnel. So stick with us, please uh, engage with us, help us help you get the information you need for yourself, your business, your clients. That is all I have. Um, we are... 
got about eight minutes or so in this hour. Happy to answer any questions that we have. Uh, let's see. Uh, we do have some stuff. David was uh, David was making promises about indexing uh, and uh, co-plotting uh, month supply of inventory and cumulative days on market. Um, great comment from Christine. Um, any other questions from the people who are here live? Happily stop screen sharing while we do that. Oh, we got double David, two of them. Any final questions for us? All right. Well, this is our final webinar. Oh, oh we do have one. Uh, could you get the YouTube link from today's webinar? Oh, of course you can. Uh, we will send out this link once we get it uploaded onto YouTube. No worries. We're always happy to send that out to any of the people who register. And that is a great segue to say, uh, please register for our January webinar, where we're going to be recapping all of 2023, not just December, but the entirety of the year. It's going to be a great uh, hour of informative charts presented by none other than David Arbit. Uh, I want to see everybody there, both those of you attending live and watching on YouTube. I'm um, looking forward to it. And until next time, happy end of 2023. Thanks, everybody.